Cupid and Psyche by Apuleius. Once upon a time there lived a king and queen who had three very beautiful daughters. They were so beautiful, in fact, that it was only just possible to find words of praise for the elder two and to express the breathtaking loveliness of the youngest, the like of which had never been seen before, and beyond all human power of speech. Every day thousands of her father's subjects came to gaze at her, foreigners too, and were so dumbfounded by the sight that they paid her the homage due to the goddess Venus alone. They pressed their right thumbs and forefingers together, reverently raised them to their lips, and blew kisses towards her. The news of her matchless beauty spread through the neighboring cities and countries. Some reported, Immortal Venus, born from the deep blue sea, and risen to heaven from its foam, has descended on earth and is now incarnate as a mortal at whom everyone is allowed to gaze. Others, no, this time the earth, not the sea, has been impregnated by a heavenly emanation and has borne a new goddess of love, all the more beautiful because she is still a virgin. The princess's fame was carried farther and farther to distant provinces and more distant ones, and people made long pil pilgrimages over land and sea to witness the greatest wonder of their age. As a result, nobody took the trouble to visit Venus's shrines and Cyprian Paphos, or Carian Nidos, or even the Isle of Crytheria, where her lovely foot first touched dry land. Her festivals were neglected, her rites discontinued, the cushions on which her statues had been prop propped at her sacred temple feasts were kicked about the floor, the statues themselves were left without their usual garlands, her altars were unswept and cluttered with the foul remains of month-old burned sacrifices. Her temples were allowed to fall into ruins. When the young princess went out on her morning walk through the uh, streets, victims were offered in her honor. Sacred feasts spread for her, flowers scattered in her path, and rose garlands presented to her by an adoring crowd of suppliants who addressed her all by the titles that really belonged to the great goddess of love herself. This extraordinary transfer of divine honors to a mortal naturally angered the true Venus. Unable to suppress her feelings, she shook her head menacingly and said to herself, Really now, whoever thought that I'd be treated like this? All the world's lovely Venus, whom the philosophers call the universal mother and the original source of all five elements. So I'm expected to share my sovereignty, am I, with a mortal who goes about pretending to be myself and to watch my bright name, which is registered in heaven, being dragged through the dirty mud of earth. Oh yes, and I must be content, of course, with the reflected glory of worship paid to this girl, grateful for a share in the expiatory sacrifices offered to her instead of me. It meant nothing. I suppose when the shepherd Paris, whose just and honest verdict Jupiter himself confirmed, awarded me the apple of beauty over the heads of my two goddess rivals? No, it's quite absurd. I can't let this silly creature, whoever she may be, usurp my glory any longer. I'll very soon make her sick and sorry about her good looks. They are dead against the rules. She at once called her winged son Eros, Elias Cupid, that very wicked boy, with neither manners nor respect for decencies, who spends his time running from building to building all night long with his torch and arrows, ruining, breaking up respectable homes. Somehow he never gets punished for all the harm he does, though he never seems to do anything good in compensation. Venus knew that he was naturally bent on mischief, so she tempted him to still worse behavior by bringing him to the city where the princess lived. Her name, by the way, was Psyche and telling him the whole story of the new cult that had grown up around her. Groaning with indignation, she said, I implore you, darling, as you love your mother, to use your dear little arrows and that sweet torch of yours against this impudent girl. If you have seen any respect for me, you'll give me my revenge, revenge in full. You'll see that the princess falls desperately in love with some perfect outcast of a man, someone who has lost rank fortune, everything, someone who goes about in terror of his life and in such complete degradation that nobody viler can be found in the whole world. She kissed him long and tenderly and then went
to the nearby seashore, where she ran along the tops of the waves as they danced foaming towards her. At the touch of her rosy feet, the whole sea suddenly calmed, and she had no sooner willed the powers of the deep to appear than up they bobbed as though she had shouted their names. The Nyrids were there, singing a part song, and Neptune, sometimes called Portumnus, with his bluish beard, his wife Celassia, the naughty goddess of the deep sea, with a lap full of aphrodisiac fish, and little Palemon, their charioteer, riding on a dolphin. After those came troops of tritons, swimming about in all directions, one blowing softly on his conch shell, another protecting Venus from the sunburn with a silk parasol, a third holding a mirror to her to admire herself in, and a whole team of them yoked two and two harnessed to her car. When Venus goes for an ocean cruise, she's attended by quite an army of retainers. Meanwhile, Psyche got no satisfaction from all the honors paid her. Everyone stared at her, everyone praised her, but no commoner, no prince, no king even, dared to make love to her. All wondered at her beauty, but only as they might have wondered at an exquisite statue. Both her less beautiful elder sisters, whose reputation was not so great, had been courted by kings and successfully married to them. But Psyche remained single. She stayed at home feeling very miserable and rather ill and began to hate the beauty which everyone else adored. Her poor father feared that the gods might be angry with him for allowing his subjects to make so much of her. So he went to the ancient oracle of Apollo at Miletus and, after the usual prayers and sacrifices, asked where he was to find a husband for his daughter whom nobody wanted to marry. Apollo, through an Ionian Greek and true founder of Miletus, chose to deliver the following oracle in Latin verse. On some high mountain's craggy summit place, the virgin, decked for deadly nuptial rites, nor hope a son-in-law of mortal birth, but a dire mischief, viperous and fierce, who flies through aether when with fire and sword, tires and debilitates all things that are, terrific to the powers that reign on high, great Jupiter himself fears his winged pest, and streams and Stygian shades his power abhor. The king, who until now had been a happy man, came slowly back from the oracle, feeling thoroughly depressed, and told his queen what an unfavorable answer he got. They spent several miserable days brooding over their daughter's fate and weeping all the while. But time passed, and the cruel oracle had to be obeyed. The hour came when a procession formed up for Psyche's dreadful wedding. The torches chosen were ones that burned low with a sooty, spluttering vein. Instead of the happy wedding march of flutes, played a querulous Lydian lament. The marriage chant ended with funeral howls, and the poor bride wiped tears from her eyes with the corner of her flame-colored veil. Everyone turned out, groaning sympathetically at the calamity that had overtaken the royal house, and a day of public mourning was at once proclaimed. But there was no help for it. Apollo's oracle had to be obeyed. So, when the preliminaries of this hateful ceremony had been completed in deep grief, the bridal procession moved off, followed by the entire city, and at the head of it walked Psyche, with an air of a woman going to her grave, not to her bridal bed. Her parents, overcome with grief and horror, tried to dislay things by holding up the procession, but Psyche herself opposed them. Poor father, poor mother, why torment yourselves by prolonging your grief unnecessarily? You are old enough to know better. Why increase my distress by crying and shrieking yourselves hoarse? Why spoil the two faces that I love best in the world by crying your eyes sore and pulling out your beautiful white hair? Why beat your dear breasts until my own heart aches again? Now, too late, you at last see the reward that my beauty has earned you, the curse of divine jealousy for the extravagant honors paid me. When the people all over the world celebrate me as the new Venus and offered me sacrifices, then was the time for you to grieve and weep as though I was already dead. I see now 
I see it as clearly as daylight that the one cause of all my misery is this blasphemous use of the goddess's name. So lead me up to the rock of the oracle. I am looking forward to my lucky bridal night and my marvelous husband. Why should I hesitate? Why should I shrink from him, even if he has been born for the destruction of the whole world? She walked resolutely forward. The crowds followed her up to the rock at the top of the hill, where they left her. They returned to their homes in deep dejection, extinguishing the wedding torches with their tears and throwing them away. Her broken-hearted parents shut themselves up in their palace behind closed doors and heavily curtained windows. Psyche was left alone, weeping and trembling at the very top of the hill, until a friendly west wind suddenly sprang up. It played around her, gradually swelling out her skirt and veil and cloak, until it lifted her off the ground and carried her slowly down into a valley at the foot of the hill, where she found herself gently laid on a bed of the softest turf, starred with flowers. It was such a cool, comfortable place to lie that she began to feel rather more composed. She stopped crying and fell asleep, and when she awoke, feeling thoroughly refreshed, it was still daylight. She rose and walked calmly towards the tall trees of a nearby wood, though through which a clear stream was flowing. The stream led her to the heart of the wood, where she came <coughs> upon a royal palace, too wonderfully built to be the work of anyone but a god. In fact, as soon as she came in at the gates, she knew some god must be in residence there. The ceiling, exquisitely carved in citrus wood and ivory, was supported by golden columns. The walls were sheeted with silver, on which figurines of all the beasts in the world were embossed and seemed to be running towards Psyche as she came in. There were, they were clearly the work of some demigod, if not a full god, and the pavement was a mosaic of all kinds of precious stones arranged to form pictures. How lucky, how very lucky anyone would be to have the chance of walking on a jeweled floor like that. And the other parts of the palace, which was a very large one, were just as beautiful and just as fabulously costly. The walls were faced with massive gold blocks which glittered so brightly with their own radiance that the house had a daylight of its own even when the sun refused to shine. Every room and portico and doorway streamed with light, and the furniture matched the rooms. Indeed, it seemed the sort of palace that Jupiter himself might have built as his earthly residence. Psyche was entranced. She went timorously up the steps, and after a time dared to cross the threshold. The beauty of the hall lured her on, and every new sight added to her wonder and admiration. When, well inside the palace, she came on splendid treasure chambers stuffed with unbelievable riches. Every wonderful thing that anyone could possibly imagine was there. But what amazed her even more than the stupendous wealth of this world treasury was that no single chain, bar, lock, or armed guard protected it. As she stood gazing in rapt delight, a royal, a voice suddenly spoke from nowhere. Do these treasures astound your royal highness? They are all yours. Why not go to your bedroom now and rest your tired body? When you feel inclined for your bath, we will be there to help you. This is one of your maids speaking, and afterward you will find your wedding banquet ready for you. Psyche was grateful to the unknown providence that was taking such good care of her, and did as, she, <clears throat> as the disembodied voice suggested. First she found her bedroom and dozed off again for a while. Then she went to the bath where invisible hands undressed her, washed her, anointed her, and dressed her again in her bridal costume. As she wandered out of the bathroom, she noticed a semicircular table with a comfortable chair in front of it. It was laid for a banquet, though there was nothing yet on it to eat or drink. She sat down expectantly and at once nectarous wines and appetizing dishes appeared by magic, floating up to her of their own accord. She saw nobody at all. The waiters were mere voices, and when someone came in and sang, and someone else accompanied him on the lyre, she saw neither of them, nor the lyre either. Then a whole invisible choir burst into song. When this delightful banquet was over, Seki thought it might be about time to go to bed, so she went to her bedroom and again undressed and lay awake for a long time. 
Toward midnight, she heard a gentle whispering near her, and began to feel lonely and scared. Anything might happen in a vast, uninhabited place like this, and she had fears for her chastity. But no, it was the whisper of her unknown husband. Now he was climbing into bed with her. Now he was taking her into his arms and making her his wife. He left her hastily just before daybreak, and almost at once she heard the voices of her maids reassuring her that though she had lost her virginity, her chastity was safe. So she went to sleep again. The next day she made herself more at home in her palace, and on the following night her invisible husband paid her another visit. The third day and night were spent in the same way, until, as one might expect, the novelty of having invisible servants wore off, and she settled down to what was a very enjoyable routine. At any rate, she could not feel lonely with so many voices about her. Meanwhile, the old king and queen were doing exactly what she had asked them not to do, wasting their time in unnecessary grief and tears, and the news of Psyche's sad fate spread from country to country until both her elder sisters heard all the details. They left their palaces and hurried back in deep grief to their native city to console their parents. On the night of their arrival, Psyche's husband, whom she still knew only by touching and hearing, warned her. Lovely Psyche, darling wife, the fates are cruel. You are in deadly danger. Guard against it vigilantly. Your elder sisters are alarmed at the report of your death. They will soon be visiting the rock from which the west wind blew you down into this valley to see whether they can find any trace of you there. If you happen to hear them mourning for you up there, pay no attention at all. You must not answer them, nor even look up to them. For what would cause me great unhappiness and bring utter ruin on yourself? Psyche promised to do as her husband asked, but when the darkness had vanished, and so had he, the poor girl spent the whole day in tears, complaining over and over again that not only was she a prisoner in this wonderful palace without a single human being to chat with, but her husband had now forbidden her to relieve the minds of her poor sisters, or even to look up at them without speaking. That night she went to bed without proper supper or bath, or anything else to comfort her, and soaked her pillows with tears. Her husband came in earlier than usual, drew her to him, still weeping, and expostulated gently with her. Oh, Psyche, what did you promise me? What may I expect you to do next? You have cried all day and all evening, and now when I hold you close to me, you go on crying. Very well, then, do as you like. Follow your own disastrous fancies. But I warn you solemnly that when you wish, begin to wish you would listen to me, the harm will have been done. She pleaded earnestly with him, swearing that she would die unless she were allowed to see her sisters and comfort them and have a short talk with them. In the end, she forced him to consent. He even said that she might give them as much jewelry as she pleased, but he warned her with terrifying insistence that her sisters were evil-minded women and would try to make her discover what he looked like. If she listened to them, her sacrilegious curiosity would mean the end of all her present happiness, and she would never lie in his arms again. She thanked him for his kindness, and was quite herself again. No, no, she protested. I'd rather die a hundred times over than lose you. I have no idea who you are, but I love you. I love you desperately. I love you as I love my own soul. I wouldn't exchange your kisses for the kisses of the god Cupid himself. So please, please grant me one more favor. Tell your servant, the West Wind, to carry my sisters down here in the same delightful way that he carried me. She kissed him coaxingly, whispered love words in his ear, and wound her arms and legs more closely around him, and called him, my honey, my own husband, soul of my soul. Overcome by the power of her love, he was forced to yield, however reluctantly, and promised to give her what she asked, but he vanished again before daybreak. Meanwhile, Psyche's sisters inquired their way to the rock where she had been abandoned. Hurrying there, they wept and beat their breasts until the cliffs re-echoed, Psyche, Psyche, they screamed. The shrill cry reached the valley far below, 
and Psyche ran out of her palace in feverish excitement, crying, Sisters, dear sisters, why are you mourning for me? There's no need for that at all. Here I am, Psyche herself. Please, please stop that terrible noise and dry your tears. In a moment, you'll be able to embrace me. Then she whistled up the west wind and gave him her husband's orders. He at once obliged with one of his gentle puffs and wafted them safely down to her. The three sisters embraced and kissed rapturously. Soon they were shedding tears of joy, not of sorrow. Come in now, said Psyche. Come in with me to my, see my new home. It will make you both very happy. She showed them her treasure chambers, and they heard the voices of the big retinue of invisible slaves. She ordered a wonderful bath for them, and feasted them splendidly at her magical table. But this revelation of Psyche's goddess-like prosperity made them both miserably jealous, particularly the younger one, who was always very inquisitive. She was dying to know who owned all this fabulous wealth, so she pressed Psyche to tell her what sort of a man her husband was and how he treated her. Psyche was loyal to her promise and gave away nothing, but she made up a story for the occasion. She said lightly that, oh, her husband was a very handsome young man with a downy, little downy beard and spent all his time hunting in the neighboring hills and valleys. But when her sisters began to cross-examine her, she grew afraid. Suppose she contradicted herself or made a slip or broke her promise. She loaded them both with jeweled pins and rings, festooned them with precious necklaces, then summoned the west wind and asked him to fetch them away at once. He carried them up to the rock, and on their way back to the city, the poison of envy began working again in their hearts. The elder said, How blindly and cruelly and unjustly fortune has treated us. Do you think it is fair that we three sisters should be given such different destinies. You and I are the two eldest, yet we get exiled from our home and friends and married off to foreigners who treat us like slaves, while Psyche, the result of mother's last feeble effort at childbearing, is given the most marvelous palace to live in, the existence of a god for a husband, and doesn't even know how to make proper use of her tremendous wealth. Did you ever see such masses of amazing jewels, such cupboard fulls of embroidered dresses? Why, the very floors were made of gems and set in solid gold. If her husband is really as good-looking as she says, she is quite the luckiest woman in the whole world. The chances are that if he remains as fond of her as he is at present, he will make her a goddess. And my goodness! Wasn't she behaving as if she were one already, with her proud looks and condescending airs? She is only flesh and blood, after all. Yet she orders the winds about and has a palace full of invisible servants. How I hate her. My husband's older than father, balder than a pumpkin, and as puny as a little boy, and he locks up everything in the house with bolts and chains. My husband, said the younger sister, is even worse than yours. He's doubled up with sciatica, which prevents him from sleeping with me more than once in a blue moon, and his fingers are so crooked and knobby with gout that I have to spend half my time massaging them. You remember what beautiful white hands I used to have? Well, look at what a state they are in now from messing about with his stinking fermentations and disgusting salves and filthy plasters. I'm treated more like a surgeon's assistant than a queen. You're altogether too patient, my dear, in fact. If you will excuse my saying so, you're positively servile the way you accept this monstrous state of affairs. Personally, I simply can't stand seeing my younger sister living in such undeserved style. I'm glad you noticed how haughtily she treated us, and how she bragged of her wealth, and how stingy with her presence she was. Then, the moment she got bored with our visit, she whistled up the wind, and had us blown off the premises. But I'll be ashamed to call myself a woman if I don't see that she gets toppled down from her pinnacle before long and flung into the gutter. And if you feel as bitter as you ought to feel at the way she's insulted us both, 
What about joining forces and working out some plan for humbling her? I am with you, said the elder sister, and in the first place I suggest that we show nobody, not even father and mother, these presents of hers, and let nobody know that she's still alive. It's bad enough to have seen her reveling in her good luck without having to bring the news home to be spread all over the palace. But there's no pleasure in being rich unless people hear about it. Psyche must be made to realize that we're not her servants, but her elder sisters. Good, said the younger one. We'll go back to our shabby homes and our shabby husbands without telling father or mother anything. But when either of us thinks of a good plan for humbling Psyche's pride, let's come here again and boldly put it into operation. The two bad sisters shook hands on this. They hid the valuable presents that Psyche had given them, and, as they neared their father's palace, each began scratching her face and tearing out her hair in pretended grief at having found no trace of their sister, which made the king and queen sadder than ever. Then they separated. Each went back full of malicious rage to her own adopted country, thinking of ways for ruining her innocent sister, even if it meant killing her. Meanwhile, Psyche's unseen husband gave her another warning. He asked her one night, Do you realize that a dangerous storm is brewing in the far distance? It will soon be on you, and unless you take the most careful precautions, it will sweep you away. These treacherous bitch wolves are scheming for our destruction. They will urge you to look at my face, though, as I have often told you, once you see it, you lose me forever. So if these hateful vampires come to visit you again, and I know very well that they will, you must refuse to speak to them. Or, if this is too difficult for a girl as open-hearted and simple as yourself, you must at least take care not to answer any questions about me. Pretend that you have not heard them. This is most important, because we have a family on the way. Though you are still only a child, you will soon have a child of your own, which will be born divine if you keep our secret but mortal if you divulge it. Psyche was exultant when she heard that she might have a god for a baby. She began excitedly counting the months and days that must pass before it was born, but she knew very few of the facts of life and could not make out why the mere breach of her maidenhead was having so odd an effect on her figure. The wicked sisters were now hurrying to Psyche's palace again with the ruthless hate of furies and once more she was warned, Today is the fatal day. Your enemies are near. They have struck camp, marshaled their forces, and sound the charge. They are enemies of your own sex and blood. They are your elder sisters, rushing at you with drawn swords aimed at your throat. Oh, darling Psyche, what dangers surround us. Have pity on yourself, and on me, and on our unborn child. Keep my secret safe, and guard us all from the destruction that threatens us. Refuse to see those wicked women. They have forfeited the right to be called your sisters because of the deadly hate they bear you. Forbid them to come here. Refuse to listen to them when, like sirens leaning over the cliff, they make the rocks echo with their unlucky voices. Preserve absolute silence. Psyche, her voice broken with sobs, said, Surely you can trust me. The last time my sisters came to visit me, I gave you convincing proof of my loyalty and my powers of keeping a secret. It will be the same again tomorrow. Only tell the West Wind to do his duty as before, and allow me to have a sight, at least, of my sisters, as a very poor consolation for never seeing you, my darling. These fragrant curls dangling all around your head, these cheeks as tender and smooth as my own, this breast which gives out such extraordinary heat. Oh, how I look forward to finding out what you are really like by studying my baby's face. So please, be sweet and humor my craving. It will be ha bad for the baby if you refuse, and make your psyche happy. You and I love each other so much. I promise that if you let me see them, I won't be so frightened of the dark or so anxious to look at you when I have you safe in my arms, light of my life. Her voice and sweet caresses broke down his resistance. He wiped her eyes dry with hair, granted what she asked, 
and, as usual, disappeared again before the day broke. The wicked sisters landed again together at the nearest 